Ladies and gentlemen, could you find your seats, please? We'd like to begin. We don't have a rim shot for the... <laughs> Right, there you go. We don't have a rim shot tonight. There's not a band, so there we go. Well, good evening, everybody. Shabbat Shalom, Chag Sameach. We're so happy to see so many people here tonight. On behalf of the Daniel Pearl Education Center, my name is Andy Boyarski. For those of you that don't know me, uh, we are the, our hardworking committee uh, has put this together tonight, and I think that you're going to be quite impressed. You know, it's been 21 years since we started the Daniel Pearl Education Center, and we strive to bring important programming to the, to the temple, to the community, and tonight will be no exception. So while I have this many people here, I'd like to remind you that Tuesday night, October 17th, we will have our annual Daniel Pearl World Music Day concert here in the synagogue. Larry Wolfert and his friend will be performing with a sing-along. It's gonna be quite an interesting evening. Uh, we hope to see as many of you as possible. So thank you again so much for being here. I guess tonight's uh, talk, which really follows very nicely from the rabbi's sermon on Yom Kippur having to do with anti-Semitism. When I think about uh, talking to Jewish people about anti-Semitism, the first phrase that comes to my mind is preaching to the choir, but uh, I think it's still very, very important. I am not going to go through Dr. Watson's CV because just like the rabbi had three hours to talk about the history of Israel, I don't have three hours to talk to you about his CV, which is most impressive. And by the way, three quarters of you know him anyway. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce and thank him for being here, Dr. Robert Watson. Okay, can everyone hear me all right? Shabbat Shalom. Uh, Rabbi Eisenkramer, thank you for making me feel welcome, Mr. President. Um, to uh, Kevin and the Cantor, the music was beautiful and, and, and powerful, touching. And uh, Andy, thank you for the invitation to come up. It's an honor to be here uh, tonight. So my topic is very heavy. Uh, probably like me, all of you, have, this is my 33rd, 34th year as a professor, even though I'm 28. Um, and I've spent my whole adult life, like all of you, pondering the roots of anti-Semitic hate. Uh, how could the German people have done what they did? How is it that it's back in the United States today and globally? There are a number of organizations from the FBI to the ADL, Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, the Brennan Center, uh, Trinity College. There's about a half dozen prominent organizations that track hate crimes. And many of them have been tracking them since the 1960s. And what they've seen is it's a steady decline in every category until about 2016. And then it's spiked. Uh, to unprecedented highs, and then in 2017 it doubles, then 2018, and that's the trajectory. And in some ways it's equal opportunity hate, it's been directed toward the African American community, uh, directed toward the gay community, those thought to be immigrants, and to the Jewish community. And the highest spike is toward the Jewish community. Corresponding with this unprecedented spike in hate crimes has been an unprecedented spike in membership in the KKK, neo-Nazi groups, uh, the Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, QAnon, uh, these fascist organizations, their numbers are exploding. So all the groups have found this, something's happening. The hate is everything from people being killed to microaggressions on college campuses to defacement of Jewish cemeteries to uh, swastikas being painted and the list goes on. We've all seen an uptick in activities from the BDS movement, that's Boycott, Divest, Sanction, on college campuses around the country. Uh, we've all seen an uptick in the Students for Justice in Palestine, some rabid and radicalized hate movements on campuses around the country. Something's happening. Uh, with that, I've been for years trying to ponder all this. Now, I don't for a minute, please, believe that I have an answer to anything. What I'd like to do is propose some new ways for you to think about it and offer some um, uh, 
some insights into the history and perhaps how that led to Nazi Germany and perhaps how that's leading to where we are today. Okay, everyone? So go ahead, sir. Um, so just to get started, if you could take a time machine and go back to 1933, Hitler comes to power in January of 1933, here's what you would find. The German people were arguably among the best traveled, best read people on earth. German civilization, German cultural, academic, scientific institutions were the envy of the world. And Hitler comes to power and in no time flat, this dynamic, robust culture commits the most heinous crimes in human history, right? How is this possible? Now, you look at Hitler, and he would seem to be the most unlikely of leaders. People say he was charismatic. He spewed hate. He wasn't charismatic. Um, Hitler was, uh, rose to the lofty rank of corporal during World War I. He was a narcissist, a compulsive liar, failed in business, a mediocre artist who was a social misfit. He had no friends. He couldn't shake hands with anybody. He sold out every friend around him. How could this, it's not that he was a six foot five, handsome athletic star and a hero on the uh, battlefield. Within no time at all, this guy takes this dynamic culture and they commit some of the most heinous crimes in the world. Well, there's a lesson there because it also happened in Italy. Mussolini was a narcissistic, lying, failure in business, a social misfit, just an oddball. And look what he did to Italian civilization. The same can be said for Franco in Spain, Salazar in Portugal, Tojo in Japan, Stalin in Russia. And it goes on and on and on. Um, so as we look at this, what I tried to do is as follows. I wanted to figure out who were Hitler's philosophers. Who did he read? Who influenced him? What was he citing as a justification for these heinous crimes? So we'll talk about that. What were the required books in schools in Nazi Germany? If we could go back to 1936 and take a high school class or college class, what would we be reading? What did he require as a part of the curriculum? What were they teaching in science classes? What were they teaching in history classes? So we'll take a look at all that, and I think there's, it's going to shed some light. Here's an interesting way to start. Wilhelm Marr. Uh, in the 1870s, around the time of the creation of the modern state of Germany. Modern state of Germany is recent. He had two works. One was called The Victory of Judaism Over Germanism. The other one, The Victory of Germanism Over Judaism. And what he said is there's been a 2,000-year plot by Jews to kill everyone and take over the world. Therefore, anything against Jews is justified, including killing and genocide. Um, the second follow-up is the victory of Germanism over Judaism, and this is how it's going to happen, he said. We're going to kill everybody, and we're going to let the world know that Jews are engaged in this plot. I say this for the following. Wilhelm Marr was completely discredited, but there's a lesson there. No matter how completely discredited you are, people will still listen to you. And this is true everywhere. Um, Wilhelm Marr's book influenced Hitler. This is a required reading in Germany in the 30s. So this is what you and I and our kids, if we were living in Germany in the 30s, this is what we would have read. And he goes back through and he picks several events in history, none of which are true. And he claims they're all true and it's all evidence of this Jewish plot and therefore killing Jews is justified. Got it? So what we'll do is we'll look at a few of those events and how they influenced Hitler and how they came into uh, the schools in Germany. We'll look at some other events that Hitler brought into the schools, and then we'll see how today this book is sort of a manifesto for QAnon and the Proud Boys. You know, too often we think of, let's say, a QAnon or Proud Boy member as some, you know, stereotypical guy living in rural Idaho in a trailer with a pickup truck and a Confederate flag, but they're reading stuff, but they're reading this. So, here we are in 2023, and this kind of drivel is back. All right, so go ahead and click, and we'll... Here's the first event, of course. Jews as Jesus killers. The argument by Marr, which was taught in schools in Germany, was um, uh, Jesus had uncovered this Jewish plot, so Jews had to kill him. Of course, never mind that Jesus was a Jew, right? 
Um, do as I say, not as history teaches, right? So an eternity of blame because Jews killed the Messiah to cover up this plot, he alleges. Any crime against Jews is more than justified. Next. Uh, you're looking at Constantine, Emperor Constantine. So Constantine is one of the architects of, I guess you could say, modern Christendom, Christianity. Uh, Constantine is not really faithful. He's more of an opportunist. His mother was a true believer. Constantine uses this faith of Christianity to drive a wedge between people, divide and conquer, like so many politicians. His mother was the true believer. Constantine presides over the Edict of Milan, I put it at the bottom of the screen, and the First Council of Nicaea. This is where they set out the tenets of Christianity. Uh, the virgin birth of Jesus, um, the date of Jesus' birth. He rose from the dead, took a seat with the Father in heaven, that sort of a thing. But what a lot of people forget is also a part of the edict in Milan and the Council of Nicaea were stating that Jews cannot be full citizens. Uh, interracial, interreligious relationships are banned and prohibited. So Constantine was a bigot and anti-Semite who used this to drive a wedge between and against the Jewish people. His mother, as I said, was a true believer, and her story's almost like Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark, okay? A movie I showed my kids a hundred times so that they would understand that professors are really cool, okay? Um, so um, his mother went to the Holy Land to find the Holy Grail. He, uh, she wanted to find the Ark of the Covenant. She wanted to find the sword or spear that pierced Jesus' side, the crown of thorns. She went to find all this. She wanted to bring it back to imbue Constantine with godlike powers. And also that Constantine would march in the war holding up these biblical relics, which would put the fear of God literally in his enemy. Uh, now, that's the premise of Indiana Jones. The Nazis actually did this. Hitler tasked Heinrich Himmler, and you all know him, to create an academic think tank called the Ananeraba, A-H-N, the Ananeraba. Um, and this was a pseudo-academic think tank because it was all full of fooey, but they literally sent archaeologists and historians around the world to find biblical artifacts to bring back to imbue Hitler with immortality. And remember, 1932, Germany's leading the world in science, and look where they are in a couple of years, right? No longer believing in science. Uh, and for Hitler to march into war, into battle with these artifacts. And lo and behold, Constantine's mother finds all this stuff in the Holy Land. I'm sure she encountered a local merchant named Crazy Muhammad's two-for-one sale. You need the sword and the crown of thorns. I have two. <laughs> $9.99, and they're both yours, right? So she comes back with all this, and Constantine uses it for his... Uh, power base. Of course, the sacking of Jerusalem, what, in the 70s a, uh, CE. Um, the argument behind the sacking was that the Romans sacked Jerusalem because they were privy that Jews were trying to take over the world and kill everyone. Okay, so there's your revisionist history. Um, of course, one of the sidebars, I guess, of the sacking of Jerusalem is the Roman army. It occurs during Passover. So the Roman army allows Jews from far and wide into the city knowing that once they encircled the city with too many mouths to feed, people would starve inside the city, and that would help them to defeat and sack it. So all this revisionism is part of Wilhelm Marr's work, and it's taught in Germany, and it's back today. Next. Blood libel. Uh, this comes from the year 1150. There was a, an English monk, Thomas of Monmouth, and uh, you've all heard of this. This is the idea that uh, Jews kill Christian boys to use their blood to make matzah, and rabbis harvest Christian boys' blood for Passover ceremonies. Now, this comes from the year 1150. Thomas of Monmouth, uh, a monk, he was, and I'm going to use the word infatuated, uh, with a little boy named William. He was obsessed with this little boy, William. And the little boy disappears. And it's one of these cold cases from history. Nobody knows what happened to little William. I have my theory on what happened to William, given Thomas's obsession with this little boy. What Thomas announces is, I've uncovered why we can't find William. Jews took him because he was holy, and they harvested his blood for matzah and blah, 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 blah. And there on the right, 
I took this picture. This is one of the cathedrals in Europe that still has etched uh, a group of rabbis harvesting a Christian boy's blood for um, Passover, allegedly. Unfortunately, Thomas of Monmouth, after he concocts this crazed story, he goes on the 12th century equivalent of a book tour and speaking tour and spreads this all across Europe. And it was welcomed. People saw this as a way of justifying attacks against the Jewish community. Bishops, cardinals, Christian leaders were too happy to hear this because the tithings came into the church and they could use it to just, the enemy of my enemy, right? Scare people and they'll do whatever you want them to do. So this is where blood libel comes from. Go ahead. And there I put Thomas of Monmouth in the middle of the uh, screen. Uh, you all know about the Crusades, so I'll go to the bubonic plague. Um, in the 1340s, uh, the Black Death, bubonic plague, historians estimate that it took one-third of Europe. It claimed one-third of Europe. COVID was unimaginable. It affected all of our lives in countless ways and over a million Americans dead within the first, right? Uh, but COVID was a walk in the park compared to the bubonic plague. One-third of Europe. Making matters worse, no one knew what caused the plague. And there was no known vaccination or cure. So thus, chaos, superstition, fear, and hate took place. I published two books this summer, two new ones. One book is, I called it America's First Plague. In 1793, we had our first major pandemic, and they called it our plague. It was a yellow fever outbreak. And I estimate that it killed 10 to 20 percent of the population, making it per capita the worst plague that we've ever had. And what was interesting and alarming to me as an historian, and alarming and interesting, but I guess I expected it, was um, about half the country, uh, George Washington was president. This is the first year of his second term. Uh, and George Washington and the mayor of Philadelphia, Mayor Clarkson, that was the capital at the time, they were building Washington, D.C., uh, they asked people to wear masks. And about half the country did, and the other half refused to, saying it was the freedom to not wear a mask. Um, half the people believed in it, and the other half said it was fake and a hoax. Um, the Southern Conservative political party blamed the other party for the, the plague. Um, and then what happened was they blamed immigrants. And there were roving vigilante bands hunting down immigrants in this country. We we're four years into this new nation. We forgot the ideals that we were founded upon. And then after immigrants, then they blamed the black community. And then after that, who did they blame? The Jewish community. It was the synagogue of Satan, is what they called it. Uh, and, and in many ways, whenever there's a crisis, I think a crisis brings out the best in humanity, but it also brings out the worst. And lo and behold, same thing happened. So the answer to where the bubonic, the bubonic plague came from in the 1340s was Jews caused it. Jews poisoned the wells to take everybody out, to overtake the world, to kill everybody, and part of this plot. Uh, what was the evidence? Uh, one third of Europe died. In the Jewish community, it was less than a third. We don't know. One in seven, one in ten. You know, historians are still debating. Why? Folks had to live separate. Kosher. Hygiene. So it was a little lower in the Jewish community than the non-Jewish community. So, aha, Jews must have caused the bubonic plague. And Jews were slaughtered wholesale as a result of this. There's a mask. This is uh, what you would see in Venice during the quaranta or the quarantine and what you saw during the bubonic plague. They used a bird's beak in history because they believed that vinegar neutralized demons and poisons. So what they would do is they would dip a cloth in vinegar, put it at the end of it, but you could still breathe here. So that's why they used these masks. So as insane as blood libel is, and Jews using Christian boys' blood for matzah, and as insane as the bubonic plague theories are, this was taught in Germany in the 30s. And this nonsense is back today in some of these QAnon radical uh, fascist groups in their, in their literature. Next. The Inquisition. Uh, you know about this so very quickly. Uh, that's Turkamata on the top right, the Grand Inquisitor. And uh, one of the arguments behind the Inquisition, of course, is Jews are taking over the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, so Jews must be killed. 
Jews were given a choice, convert, die, or leave. Um, what happened, though, is sooner rather than later, the idea of the conversos, right, and the auto de fe was used, and that is this. A lot of the Jews that converted, maybe they didn't really mean to convert. Maybe they just did it to avoid dying. So what happened was they were tortured. Jews were tortured. Jews were tortured until they confessed. And you and I know that under duress and torture, anyone will say anything, right? Once they confessed, then they were killed. If they didn't confess, they were tortured until they were killed. So the choice for Jews was to die or to die. And all this comes from this nonsense that there was some kind of Jewish plot to take over the world. And this still finds its way in some of these online conspiracy theory circles. Sir? Martin Luther. So Martin Luther's known for a number of things in addition to tacking some theses on a schoolhouse door, right? And leading the Protestant Reformation against the old Catholic Church. But Martin Luther was also a bigot and an anti-Semite. He wrote a vicious book, which was one of Hitler's favorites, which was required reading in Germany, The Jews and Their Lives, 1545. And in the book, he complains about a Jewish plot to take over the world. Jews killed Jesus so we can commit genocide against the Jewish people, et cetera, et cetera. Martin Luther argues that Jesus did not die for Jews or Turks or, and he has a list. Why? He said, Jews have no souls. There is no heaven. There is no, it's almost as if instead of the same racial group or same species, we're different species. And therefore, just of anything can be justified against the Jewish community. Now, a lot of the Spanish and Portuguese conquistadors and explorers, when they came to the New World, right, their benefactor was the Catholic Church, right, everybody? And they came for God, gold, and glory, not necessarily in that order. And they were told to convert the heathen in the New World. Well, they weren't always successful in converting the local people. Why? They're raping them, they're looting, and they're mass murdering them, of course. But one of the arguments you see from a lot of these early conquistadors is when they would tell the Spanish church that they weren't able to successfully convert everyone, they said because Martin Luther said they don't have souls. So there is no salvation for them. We can just rape and pillage and there's no consequence. It's like eating an animal or putting an animal in a zoo or wearing them or something. So this is, and Martin Luther, uh, a lot of this comes from him. Next. Okay, this was not a part of Wilhelm Marr because it came afterward, but it would be a part of, of what was taught in German schools. Everybody's heard of the Dreyfus Affair, the late 1890s. So what it was was um, in France, they discovered that somebody was leaking state secrets to Germany, and they didn't know who that was. One of the first people they grabbed was Dreyfus. Why? He was a Jew. Now, all historical records suggest strongly that Dreyfus served with great honor and was innocent. And after the trial, his innocence was found, and they found the culprit. He never got a full exoneration. But. So Dreyfus was tried. He was dragged before a military tribunal. And the ultimate decision of the tribunal was a, a tautological argument, a circular argument. And the conclusion was there is no evidence that Dreyfus did this, Therefore, Dreyfus destroyed all the evidence, ergo, guilty. Um, and he was banished halfway around the world for hard labor. Uh, what comes out of this, though, is this idea, and everybody's heard it, and it, again, it spread like wildfire across Europe, just like blood libel in the 1500s. The idea that Jews can never be loyal to a government or anything other than their faith. Thus, Jews cannot be trusted in positions of government, uh, politics, the law, academia, whatever. Uh, uh, and so this spreads like wildfire, and, and everybody points at Dreyfus. So that's one of the vicious outcomes of this trial, is this horrific idea that Jews should not be in politics or the law or anything because, quote unquote, they're not loyal to anything but their faith. There was another interesting sidebar from the trial, and it involved Theodore Herzl. Everybody knows Herzl. Uh, so as a young man in, uh, you know, growing up around Budapest, he was controversial. Uh, a lot of uh, Jews could not stand him. Herzl was excessively secular. His argument was that Jews should dress like 
non-Jews should use, should speak French and English, should adopt Christian names for their kids, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, almost as if by being identifiably Jewish, we're bringing this on ourselves. That was sort of his, his argument. So you can see that it was very controversial. He works as a journalist and he gets a job in Vienna. So Dreyfus is excited to go to Vienna because he said it's the second most cultured place in the world behind northern Jersey. Um, so he can't wait to go to Vienna because he's, it's going to prove that there is no anti-Semitic hate once he gets there. So he arrives in Vienna and guess what he finds? Yeah, anti-Semitic hate in, in abundance. But while he's in Vienna, the Dreyfus trial occurs. So his editor sends him to Paris to cover the trial. Now he's excited and he writes that Paris is the world's most cultured city. It'll prove what I've been arguing, that there is no anti-Semitic hate, we can all live fine, and blah, 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 blah. He goes to Paris to cover the trial and imagine the shock when he sees how they railroaded Dreyfus. This event was so dramatic that this, probably more than anything, is what flipped uh, Herzl 180 degrees. After this, he wants to create the Zionist Congress, right? And a couple years later, they go to Basel, Switzerland for the first meeting of the Congress. And there is when he says we need a homeland. Um, so that's the Dreyfus trial, which uh, in German schools in the 30s, Dreyfus sold out France and Jews can't be trusted. This is what was taught. Next. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Has anybody heard of this book? Tragically, one of the best-selling, most interpreted, translated books in print. Uh, the book is basically like Wilhelm Marr's book. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and you can tell from the, the images on the cover, uh, the depictions of Jews on the cover, the book says that there's a 2,000-year history of Jews trying to kill everybody and take over the world. Consequently, any violence is justified toward Jews. This book has been... Uh, reprinted in translation. Um, I actually, uh, given what I do for a living, I went to a KKK rally in Alabama to watch it, to talk to my students about it. I went to, I was just telling folks at dinner that uh, this winter at Florida Atlantic University, and it was at University of Central Florida, Florida State, South Florida, and Florida International, uh, uh, three groups had a, a, were tabling on college campuses. It was Kanye West, uh, MAGA, and the Proud Boys. And the tables were that the Holocaust never happened. Um, so I, I go sometimes to these crazy events uh, because I think they're a teachable moment. At the least, it helps me to double, triple, quadruple down on my commitment to doing what I do with my life. But um, uh, I was at a rally a couple years ago during the election, a bunch of Proud Boys, and as a fundraiser, they were selling the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. This was 2020, everybody selling it at a, at a presidential campaign rally, the protocols. So here we are, it's back. And again, I point out the, the argument that no matter how discredited something is, people will believe it. Unfortunately, in 1903, it found its way to the United States. Uh, a very famous American, one of the most beloved and respected Americans of the era, brought it to the US, and that's Henry Ford, who was a brutal anti-Semite. Um, Ford was notoriously tight, cheap. I mean, holes in the bottom of your shoes cheap. Yet he spent part of his own fortune to print a half a million copies of this in English. And if you bought a Model T in the 19-whatevers, there was a free copy in the passenger seat when you drove off with the car. So he spread this around the U.S. Ford also bought the Dearborn newspaper in Michigan and ran over 90 editions of that newspaper solely devoted to blaming Jews for everything under the sun. The highest award in Nazi Germany was a, a, an Iron Cross, and Hitler gave it to only three people, uh, Mussolini, Franco, and Henry Ford. Henry Ford accepted it and wore it. What a monstrous human being. You know, Maybe the second most revered, beloved American in the early 1900s was Lucky Lindbergh, who was a Nazi apologist, a raving anti-Semite, a bigot, anti-black, anti-immigrant, anti-woman, anti... a monstrous human being. Um, Henry Ford is the only American that Hitler listed by name in Mein Kampf. 
his manifesto, My Struggle, he took inspiration from Henry Ford. He referred to Lindbergh in speeches because Americans love Ford and Lindbergh. The two most beloved Americans are fascists. Probably the third most influential American at the time was a guy named Father Charles Coughlin or Father Charles Coughlin, the Midwest radio priest, right? It's estimated that he had a radio listenership, get this, everybody, circa 19, late 20s, early 30s, 30 million people. Major media outlets today would give a kidney for that kind of listenership or viewership. And yet he had that back. So he dominated the radio. The problem was, of course, is he was an anti-Semite who believed that Jews killed Jesus and Jews did blood libel and Jews caused the bubonic plague. And, and he organized groups around the country. He should have been arrested for treason because his groups were being armed with the money he made. And these groups were told to be on standby in case if we have to kill as vigilantes, Jews and immigrants. Uh, as groups were called Make America Great Again groups is what they were called. Um, so Father Charles Coughlin, um, and Hitler draws inspiration from Coughlin, Lindbergh, and uh, Ford, uh, who played right into his hands. Hitler also talked about being inspired by our treatment of the American Indian. We committed genocide. He was inspired by slavery and our views of racial superiority in our country. So in a way, America, I guess, was enabling some of this. We didn't do enough, right? At least until Truman, right? Next. So... These are Hitler's two favorite philosophers. Um, and what we can see is these two influenced Mein Kampf, and a lot of their writings and, and spewings and rantings find their way into his speeches and his rationale for the final solution. Uh, Count J.A. de Gobineau was French, and Houston Stort Chamberlain was, was British. They believed that there were two racial groups. They were obsessed with the idea of racial superiority. There was the master race and the mud race. The master race were Germanics and Scandinavians. Uh, the Ubermensch, they were, as Hitler said, destined to be lords on earth. The only reason they weren't lords on earth is they've been intermarrying and interbreeding with the mud race, which has weakened the bloodline. So we need to ban interracial, the 1935 Nuremberg race laws, right? We need to exterminate non-groups, sterilize non-groups, blah, 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 blah. So um, the master race. Hitler said that they are lords on earth. They're defined by tall, blonde, blue-eyed, lean, muscular. In other words, people that look just like Hitler. <laughs> and Goebbels. And Himmler. And Goring. And Eichmann. And Speer. And Bormann. And all of them. Um, that's the master race. The mud race, Latins. Africans, Oriental was the word they used, Southern Europeans, and Jews, all the mud race. Hitler used two other words to describe the two races, which were taught in German schools if you took biology or science. The master race are, quote, unquote, civilization builders. The mud race, civilization destroyers. Every great civilization has been built by a Germanic. Now, there's the problem of ancient Greece, right? Parthenon. The, um, so what did they teach in school? Himmler and Hitler ordered that it was a German philosopher that 2,400 years ago went to Greece and taught Socrates. <laughs> what about ancient Egypt? You guessed it. 4,000 years ago, some German architects built the pyramids. Uh, they built the Colosseum. My favorite of the madness that was taught, and again, 1932, Germany's leading the world in science. And by 35, Look what happened to this country, this dynamic people. My favorite is this, uh, taught in schools. There was a German carpenter named Joseph who went to the Middle East and met a teenage girl named Mary, and they had a German baby named Jesus. Uh, yeah, sure. So the master race and the mud race. Now, the problem is uh, when the master race leaves, that's when the twilight of Egypt occurred. That's when Rome collapsed. That's when, when the Germans went back to Germany. Well, the problem is there never was a great Germanic civilization. Hitler claimed it was the Third Reich, right? Uh, the First Reich was the great German leader, Charlemagne. He was French. 
The Second Reich was the creation of the modern state of Germany in the 1870s. Um, and the Third Reich would be a thousand year reign, right? The problem is there's no evidence of a great German civilization. So Hitler ordered Heinrich Himmler through the Ananeraba, that think tank, to send historians and archaeologists on digs around Germany to find something like the Colosseum or the, right, a pyramid or something. So they dug all around Germany and all they found was pottery shards and some bones and clubs. When Rome was at its zenith, the people living in present-day Germany were living like Neanderthals. Uh, so they had, had a problem. They couldn't find any evidence of it. So this is what the textbooks were changed in Germany, and this is what they taught. The reason why there's no great German civilization in antiquity in present-day Germany is because the German people didn't come from Germany. They came from two other places. This is from the You Cannot Make This Stuff Up file. Um, if anybody's interested, I wrote and uh, researched and filmed a, a couple TV shows on this for the history, uh, excuse me, for the Science and Discovery channels called Nazi Secrets. Um, this is what they said. The German people came from two places. One, the lost city of Atlantis. So 9,000 plus years ago, in a day, both islands were sunk uh, by the god Atlas because the people were so superior. So they must have been Germans. Uh, and then they left Atlantis and went to Germany. Nobody raised their hand in the audience and said, why did it take them 9,000 years to get to? That's, that's a walk in the park compared to the second. Uh, the second place the German people came from, and this is taught in schools. This was taught in schools. They came from an ice moon that crashed into our moon and then crashed into the North Pole. I, I mean, right? If you tell someone something enough, even if it's implausible, one and one is 13. One and one is 13. After a while, little kids say it's 13. Uh, that's what they taught. And all this comes from the madness of uh, these two philosophers. And again, they were both completely discredited. The other thing we see is Hitler brings back the old 1800s debate over biological determinism and cultural relativism. Biological determinism is a fancy way of saying nature, and cultural relativism is a fancy way of saying nurture. Right, we're all trying to figure out why are we the way we are, because of our genes and our parents or because of our social opportunities? And the answer is both, right? Uh, anybody see that movie Trading Places with Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd? You remember there were these two old grumpy guys who reminded me of the two old men from the Muppets, right? And they made a bet for one dollar. And they were going to trade places between Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy is black. He's living on the streets. He's a criminal. Dan Aykroyd is white. He went to Harvard or whatever, and he's the vice president of the company. The one that believes in biological determinism, nature, says that even if Dan Aykroyd was on the streets, he would rise up because he's superior. And even if Eddie Murphy was given the vice presidency of the company in every comfort, he would fail because it's in his nature. The other one says, no, no, if Dan Aykroyd's on the streets, the streets will eat him up. And Eddie Murphy, and remember, the second guy was right. The cultural relativist was right, and they bet a dollar. So um, this debate was big in the 1800s, but then everybody dismissed it. In fact, one of the first prominent Americans to say all this is bunk was Abraham Lincoln, self-taught. Anyways, Hitler brings it all back, and Hitler announces in schools that the answer is one, biological determinism. Nature. We're solely a product of our bloodline. We're superior. The rest of you aren't. There's nothing that can be done about it. The second debate that was raging was polygenie versus monogenie. Polygenism, monogenism. Poly, many, genie, genesis. So the polygenists believed that there were separate origins of the human family. And by the time of Lincoln, this was utterly discredited, but Hitler brings it back. Whites came from Adam and Eve. Blacks came from primates in Africa. Orientals came from the orangutan in Borneo. So we're different species. We're different species, which means you can justify doing anything to anybody else. And of course, whites from Adam and Eve are superior. Monogenie, of which Lincoln was a monogenist, mono one, we're all the same human family. And today we know that we're all related, right? We all share 99 plus percent of the same DNA, and I apologize that you share my same DNA, right? And the wellspring of humanity, ironically enough, was Africa, right? Where humans first evolved in Africa. Anyways, now, 
A dangerous concoction is if you believe in biological determinism and polygeny. We're only, it's only our nature and we're separate species. That's what was taught in Germany. And imagine these children in Hitler Youth or German Maiden camps digesting this 12 hours a day. You can see the fanaticism, right, everyone? I wrote a book about the Holocaust. Um, it's called The Nazi Titanic, crazy title. Did well for me, fortunately. I have two kids in college. <laughs> um, it was the hardest book I've ever written, and I, I, I don't often cry, but I cried during the research. It was so brutal. And um, what I found was that at the end of my book is uh, there's thousands of Jewish prisoners are being put to death, and a few managed to escape, and the war is basically over. And there's some Hitler youth kids that find the, these Jewish prisoners that are escaping. And with the last breath of their lives, they're butting in their heads with, the, with their guns. They're killing people. That's how they went. And, and you think, how could a 13-year-old, when faced with either running and living, or they took their last breaths to kill people? Well, because they were brainwashed with all this nonsense. Phrenology. So a couple things, uh, Doc. Uh, you know, drilling holes in people's heads. But the other aspect of phrenology is that there's a physical manifestation of intelligence and worth. I can look at all of you, and well, I can tell everybody's smart phrenologically. Look at this audience, right? Uh, Good-looking audience. So there's some physical manifestation of intelligence, right? Today we know that that's not true, but don't we still do it? You're Asian, you got to be good at math. You can dunk a basketball, you got to be dumb, right? Right? Uh, you're Jewish, you got to be rich. You're Polish, you got to be stupid. You're Irish, you got to drink a lot. Oh, we know how that, right? People still make these assumptions. If I go for a jog, the police officer says, have a good run, Dr. Watson. If I'm 19 and black, where are you going? What did you just do? I remember my last semester in college, uh, I went to Virginia Tech, and um, we had this big economics test, and I finished early, so I went up to the professor. And my family were fourth and sixth grade educated steel mill workers from Steelton, Pennsylvania. So I knew I was getting out of Dodge, but didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew it was not steel. My goal was to live the rest of my life without a callus. Um, so plus, I worked on farms from fifth grade to twelfth grade. So I, I went, then I picked the easiest job in the world. <laughs> um, but I remember I went up to my professor when I turned my test in, and I said, "Listen, I'm thinking maybe I'll go to grad school." You know, but this, we, I, my students are shocked to find out we didn't have the internet back then, right? We had to roll down car windows, right, Larry? So, uh, so I went up to the professor and said. What is grad school? What's, what's a master's? How do you get in? What, what is it about? Um, I was lucky enough, I had a sports scholarship. I played football in college. Um, and the professor looked at me and he goes, you're on the football team, aren't you? I said, yes, sir, defensive end. He goes, Psh, you can't go to grad school. And he gives me one of these, like walk away. Didn't he make a phrenological assumption? I'm 61 now, so I'm not so fit, but I was in good shape, so I must be dumb. So we all make these phrenological assumptions. So there's got to be a way of looking at people. So what they did, and Hitler had this done, and you can see there's two pictures from Nazi Germany. The first thing they said is it's the length of your lower arm, ulna and radius, and ratio to the upper arm. Um, humerus? Am I getting that right? OK. We have doctors in the audience. Um, ulna and radius. I'll be, there's a test later, everybody. Um, so what, what they said was, the longer your lower arm and ratio to upper arm, the dumber you are. Why? Primates have a long lower arm, right? It's because they're sometimes quadrupedal. Like if I wanted to walk on all fours, it would hurt my back. My arms are long, but not that long, right? So the longer, and they, they said, well, humans have a shorter lower arm, and we're superior to primates, so it must be the length of your lower arm and ratio to the upper arm. They measured folks from Africa and found they had a slightly longer lower arm. Probably sample size bias. But, oh, that fits. Whites, blacks, primates. But then they measured the Asian sample, and they had very short arms as a group. So that would put them up top, but because everybody was right that white in Germany said, no, 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 it's a, it's a flaw. We need to find something else. So I have very long arms, which helped me in basketball and football, but no college for this kid, right? Um, so they measured arms. Uh, from there, they went to your forehead. You can see that in, in the pictures. They tried to figure out aesthetically what is the ideal human, and they decided that some of the Greek and Roman statues 
And if you look at the statues, a lot of them have rather flat foreheads. So the flatter your forehead, the more superior you are. The more sloped your forehead, I see some wives looking at their husbands right now going, <laughs> that explains it, right? Right. Um, yeah. So uh, the more sloped your forehead, the dumber you are. Why? Because a deer, a dog, a cow, don't they all have sloped foreheads? Because they walk on all fours, they're quadrupedal. So they went around measuring people's foreheads. Did anybody ever see the classic film Europa Europa? Great film, right? It's about a Jewish kid that gets orphaned and he gets caught up in the Hitler Youth. And he's sitting in class one day and Herr Professor walks in and says, you can always tell who's the Jew and who's the Aryan, phrenology. And he gets his ruler out and says, I can measure your foreheads and tell you who's the Jew and who's the Aryan. And the Jewish kid's hiding. He's sitting there in class sweating, going, oh my gosh, now they're going to figure me out. And he says, you, stand up. And he goes over to the kid and says, look, for vertical forehead, the perfect Nazi, the perfect Aryan. Um, so they went around measuring foreheads um, to try to rank the races and determine. Even Jung, the uh, psychologist, bought into this nonsense. Um, yeah, craziness. Go ahead and click to the next. Um. So this is an old textbook on the right. Uh, they, prof they, they contemplated that there might be five racial groups, which I had on the previous slide. Um, the, the, the most superior are whites, and the fifth, least superior, are Africans. Uh, the group number three were called islanders, like everybody living on an island is the same race. I guess that would be like Long Island or like Rhode Island, or one of my places, Key West, right? Um, I mean, just absolute madness. So there's a textbook of five races, and you see the lines they drew? Look at the white line on your left. See how vertical the forehead is? But look what they did by the time they go down. For non-white groups, they included their nose in the measurement. So for Jews in Germany, they would put the ruler like, now I have a big schnoz, in addition to long arms, so I'm in trouble no matter what. Um, so if they put a ruler on my head with my nose, it would be angled, right? So that's what they did for non-whites. So there's a textbook. Look on the left. This is another textbook that was brought out in Germany. You have a Apollo, a Greek up top. You have an African in the middle and a chimp at the bottom, hierarchically. And pictures don't lie, right? And if you're a kid in school and you just see this in fifth grade, you believe everything because you don't look closer. Now look closer at these pictures, however. They're trying to show the slope of the forehead. Look at Apollo's forehead, the white forehead. It's flat. The only people that have foreheads that flatter is if you headbutt trucks, right? I mean, and look at the African forehead. It's very slope. But if you look at the chimp's forehead, there's less slope than the black. See that? But now look what they did. They manipulated the skulls. For the white and the chimp skull, they're sitting up on their mandible, their jaw. For the African skull, they let it fall back. If I was holding the Greek, the white skull, and let go of it, what would it do? It would fall back, and the slope would be more than any of the other groups. But see how they manipulated this. Lower right, this is World War I. They're still measuring heads and foreheads and all that to see who's an officer and who's enlisted. In the United States and a few southern states up to the 1920s, they were sterilizing people with limited intellect based on all these kind of tests. They came up with categories like idiot, imbecile, and moron. Today, if you're mad at someone, you say, you idiot, you moron. Those were official psychological categories. If you scored X percentage points below the score, you'd be labeled as a moron. Could you imagine the family when the teacher calls them in and says, we've diagnosed your kid? They're an imbecile. I mean, this is what they did, and then people were sterilized. Next. All this was brought back into Germany. This is Lombroso, uh, the Italian father of criminology. He's a phrenologist. So if we assume that there's a physical manifestation of intelligence, remember everyone? Flatter forehead, shorter arm, whatever. Some physical manifestation of intelligence. He said, well, then there must be a physical manifestation of deviance. So what he did is he went to prison, there's his skulls, there's his photos on the right, and he took pictures of and studied prisoners. And he said there's basically six different archetypes that all prisoners tend to look like. He took the photos and would hand them out to the police. What you could do is walk around the streets looking at your photo, and if you see someone that looks like one of those, arrest them before they commit the crime. A priori. 
right? Doesn't this sound like a late night movie, right? I think there was a Tom Cruise movie like that, right? They went around. Um, at any rate, um, I think the guy in the top left looks a little like Bruce Willis. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, my gosh, right? Imagine. Uh, but uh, didn't Hitler do this? They had certain looks of Jews and others, and people were arrested and put to death as a result of it. Next. All right, this is another textbook. Uh, here are four types of innate, inborn deviance. Okay? And you can look at these people and tell. The top left, that's the big strong guy. If you can bench press 300 pounds or if you have a thick neck, you've got to be dumb and deviant. Wow. Uh, bottom left, that's the feminist, the spinster. She doesn't marry, and she's a threat to patriarchy, right? And Nazi Germany was excessively testosterone-driven and patriarchal. And I think still to the present day, a strong woman is seen as a threat. Top right, that's the Jewish financier. And you can tell from the crooked nose, which factors into his forehead, thus the crooked personality. And bottom right, that's anybody with a disability. And what did Hitler do to anybody with a disability? Right? Yeah, sure. So this is from another textbook. Next. Almost done, everyone. So what they did then is after they did the forearms and the skull and a whole bunch of other things, they settled on aesthetics. The better looking you are, the more like God that you are, the more superior you are. So now the problem is they have to find the best looking person, right? Which is in the audience here tonight, right? And they went and they said it was, it was the statue of David. Now here's, what's the great irony, everyone? <laughs> David's a Jew, right? And I'm sure during a speech, some little kid was raising his hand, Mr. Fuhrer, and the parents were like, shh, don't say anything, right? I mean, how ridiculous. So that was it. And they went around using aesthetics as a result. I don't think anybody would say Hitler is, uh, was George Clooney <laughs> or Goebbels or any of them, right? But this is what they were doing. On the right, this is another textbook. And they're showing a lack of aesthetics among inferior. Notice how they mixed Africans with primates. Wow. Look at the lady on the lower left. No one is that black. I've never met anybody who's black or white. I've met people that are kind of cocoa, khaki, coffee colored. Nobody's white. Nobody's black. Um, but look at the, and what's she doing in the air with her mouth. They're trying to make her look like a fool. Look at the top right. They gave that African guy simian features in his face, didn't he? Primate features. And they cut the top of his hat off to make him look silly. So they're manipulating the pictures. Look at the top left, the orangutan. Um, they actually combed his hair. I'm from Boca Raton, so I know that Caesar combed forward. I see it all the time. They combed his hair. Um, look at the lady on the second from the top on the right. Look what they did to her lips. I'm from Boca. I know big lips. I know big lips. Um, but isn't it interesting that today, full lips are a sign of beauty, right? Whereas back then, they're making fun of it. They're oh, good. I'm just trying to make you all laugh. I love where I live, but it is low-hanging fruit. Um, at any rate, so this is all from textbooks in Nazi Germany. Next. Start to wrap this up. So one of the things Hitler said was if Germanics only breed with Germanics, we will fulfill our destiny of being the ubermensch, the supermen, lords on earth, and we'll, we'll be gods on earth. And we will be 10 to 12 feet tall. This is what he said. And this was everybody. But, uh, so, and what he found was somebody brought to his attention the writings of Tacitus, the Roman historian and philosopher in the first century. So you know the Roman army, the... the um, centurions took over most of the Mediterranean, right, everybody? Uh, and they were away from home for years, and they were overextended, and they were... But by the time they got up to what is about France and Germany today, the Roman army was defeated by the barbarians. Well, they were defeated because of disease being overextended, and they hadn't been home in 20 years. But the soldiers, when they came back, they had to say, why were they beaten? And this is what they said, because the barbarians were 10 feet tall and they were bare chested with a club. Look at the guy in the sort of center right. And with one swing of the club, they would kill five Roman soldiers. 
and we would shoot our arrows and they would bounce off his thickly muscled chest. Well, the fish is this big, right? Um, well, you've got to make up a lie because you with your modern technology just lost to a bunch of Australopithecus, right? Um, well, Hitler gets a hold of Tacitus's writings and he says, you see, we were 10 feet tall. But because we've been interbreeding with Jews and so all this factors into the 1935 Nuremberg race laws. Next. Here's just some images of the depiction of Jews and propaganda goes a long way, right, everybody? Uh, think about the images that children today see on television and on social media. It's no wonder we all scratch our heads with kids these days, huh? Uh, top right, a dare vigor Jude. Uh, that's uh, Joseph Goebbels film, The Eternal Jew. Look at the depiction of the Jewish character, satanic, right? Looks like the devil. Uh, look at the lower right images, Jews aren't even human. Top left, a Jew is a communist. Bottom left, look who's behind the three allies in World War II, the Jewish banker. And then contrasted with the Germanic uh, on the bottom, the physical ideal, right? Uh, next, some more images. Um, Look at the lower right. Uh, there's the IDF soldier is killing Jesus. And a little quote from Mary is, don't kill him a second time. Right? Uh, top left, an Israeli politician. The Americans are simply the mouthpiece. Bottom left, that's FDR, Stalin, and Churchill. Look who the puppeteer is, a Jew. Top right, the Jewish banker sitting on the world, sitting on all the money. So these images are out there, and they're everywhere. Um, not even if they're not as blatant as some of these. Next, I'll close with, um, okay, I just thought this was interesting. So Hitler would find any German soldier over about 6'6", six, six, and he'd give him medals and stand them in public to show everybody what we're going to look like in a few years. Whenever I look at these, I just think how small Hitler looks, right? Uh, and again, nobody dared say anything. Next. Uh, so the resurgence today. As I said at the outset, as it, and I'll end where I began, um, I believe that we need to teach every generation um, the lessons of the Holocaust, lessons of hate, for the words never forget or never again to have resonance, right? Every generation needs to be taught this. As a professor, I see it every day. I have students from Brazil or China or Cuba who have never heard of the word the Holocaust. Um, I have students from the United States, if I said Goebbels, or if I said Auschwitz, or Treblinka, or Theresienstadt, they've never even heard of the word. Um, you've seen the recent study, the ADL and others did a big study, B'nai B'rith, uh, about two years ago, that one in five American school students have never heard of the Holocaust. Uh, if they don't know about it, they are susceptible to the wrong messages. So what can you do? Talk to your kids, your nieces, your nephews, and your grandkids, and empower them. So they know the truth, right? So that if, God forbid, the BDS or SJP is on a college campus, like I said at the outset, and so that way your grandkids won't be susceptible to those kind of messages. Every generation needs to be taught. This is a desecration. This was from uh, St. Louis uh, of a, uh, a Jewish cemetery. Next. Uh, this is what you find on college campuses. Uh, the students for... Uh, uh, Justice in Palestine is a really alarming group on campuses. The BDS stands for Boycott, Divest, Sanction. And uh, some of these pictures I took, uh, they're all over the place on college campuses. Um, happy to say my university, Lynn, has never had much as a drop of it. Uh, I can also say that as a badge of honor, I've been booed and boycotted on college campuses because I'm a quote unquote Zionist propaganda agent. Um, this is the nonsense uh, that you're finding next. Uh, Charlottesville, enough said, next. And what were they chanting? Jews will not replace us. And remember, Goebbels had marches with the tiki torches and the, the, like a, a form of that. Uh, there you go, next. Charlottesville's a lovely town. So you see the military there in the lower left. That's not the military. That's uh, neo-Nazi groups dressed in mil Carrying machine guns around in public, joining the, the protesters. Um, Next, that's, that's not the military coming in Charlottesville. That's neo-Nazis dressed in military garb. Next, a tree of life. Um, 
from microaggressions on college campuses to murder, right? And we know that the crazed young man that committed this atrocity in Pittsburgh, we know he was consuming all the things that we just talked about. Next. Uh, again, a college campus. Next. Uh, do one more. That's Tulane. Do one more. Uh, okay, that's, I'll do two more. That's the Students and Justice in Palestine. I put that up so you can see what the T-shirts look like. Uh, tell your kids, your grandkids. Uh, they do a, an Israel apartheid day and an Israel apartheid week on college campuses. And I think I have some pictures. Let me see. Yes, okay, this is from Berkeley. So this is a die-in. Uh, what they're symbolizing is Israel killing everybody. And all the students lie on the ground. Then they trace them with chalk figures and then write anti-Semitic things next to them. And Berkeley is one of the greatest schools on planet Earth. But this is happening there. They also simulate Palestinians being assassinated by IDF soldiers. And I have a picture of that. Next. Next. There. These two guys in camo are supposed to be IDF soldiers, and they're going to blindfold and simulate and assassinate on college campuses, everybody. So um, it's real. Um, it's out there. And I'll just say in closing, make sure that you educate your kids and your grandkids. We all need to double, triple, and quadruple down. Uh, as Andy said at the outset, sometimes we're preaching to the converted, uh, but we still need to reiterate to one another, remind one another what's going on. Find out what's happening at your alma mater. Find out what's happening where you send your kids and grandkids and demand that something be done about it. I will not buy a T-shirt, go to a football game, or send a kid to your school until you get something done about it. You're a stakeholder and a powerful stakeholder. Vote with your wallet, right? There's a lot that we can do about all this. Uh, and with that, I thank you for your time. So again, I, I don't believe for a minute I have an answer to what made Hitler Hitler and why the German people did what they did and why it's back today. But we can see this vicious loop repeating. Right, everybody? It's repeating. And the same nonsense for 2,000 years. It's been utterly discredited, and it's back today. So questions? Yeah. 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 So the comment is about how crazy this is, and people don't think. Yeah, I know a lot of people that don't believe in evolution, that don't believe in climate change, and yet they've never had a biology class, right? Um, they believe who knows who they believe talking about this rather than 99% of the world's award-winning scientists. Um, you know, if you need open heart surgery, um, you know, go see Andy. Don't see me. I don't know anything about it, right? Uh, if you're going to have your tooth pulled, you don't go see a plumber or a baker. You go to a dentist, right? Um, but people will go to a plumber or a dentist to figure out science, right, instead of scientists. Um, I, I, because of what I do for a living, um, I can't go to a supermarket or get gas with, without, I like this, somebody will come up and say, thanks for speaking at our Hadassah chapter. Could you recommend a good book for me? And I'll go, you bet, mine, you know. <laughs> but then every day I, I get someone that comes up and tells me to F myself and die. Um, and they're mad, and they start spewing the most insane and hateful things imaginable. So I wear it as a badge of honor. But one of the lines I oftentimes use is, you know, if my doctor told me I had leukemia, and the, all the great doctors told me I had leukemia, my answer should, be, should not be, no, I don't because I don't believe in it. But that's what our collective answer is as an American people. Um, and look what's happened to this country in terms of what we believe and don't believe. Uh, academically, educationally, look at where we are. Politically, we've lost civility. We've lost common decency. We've lost a sense of decorum. Uh, I texted my girlfriend 
from the airport when I was flying out earlier because I saw two couples. She was carrying all sorts of things, and the guy was just, her husband was just standing there. And then when we got on the plane, I was like four people back. This woman almost fell trying to put her suitcase up, and the husband was on his phone and didn't do it. I'm like, ma'am, I'll help you. Hold on, hold on. And so I text her. I'm like, what's wrong with these people, right? Um, we've lost civility from not helping, not holding the door for someone to road rage to reality television, right? The desperate housewives of Boca or whatever you're watching, right? To anti-Semitic, the resurgence of hate. So there's something happening, um, which means we need, as I said, double, triple, quadruple down on everything. Ma'am? Mm -hmm. Before Hitler, they were extermination of the Slovenian Jews. Mm -hmm. And so when Hitler came in, everything was all set up to just exterminate the Jews. And by focusing on Hitler, I think that we, mm -hmm. we make ourselves blind and that we, we try to figure out what was the okay. So by focusing on Hitler, we're doing a disservice because those sorts of crimes, not to that level and not at a wholesale industrial level of mass murder, but those things were happening. Uh, yeah, 2,000 years of it. That's one of the things I tried to show. For 2,000 years, this has been happening. Hitler just borrowed what had been out there. And number two, he was very good at blame mongering, fear mongering, and scapegoating. It's the Jews. It's their fault. It's immigrants. It's which all societies do that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Strong eugenics movement. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sure. No, it's, uh, and I'll borrow Elie Wiesel again, the perils of indifference, right? When good people do nothing, uh, that's when this happens. And, and first they came for this group, then they came for that group. And, and when we didn't stand up, then they come for us and there's no one left, right? Um, and this has happened throughout history and it's happening today. And you could look at Rwanda, you can look at any number of examples around the world, right, everyone? Uh, so we have to always find our voice. Uh, you know, my, both my kids and my girlfriend are constantly telling me, you just need to be quiet. Uh, and I always say, well, then you don't know me. I mean, no, I, I'm not. I, I fight every fight, right? Um, because the stakes are too high. Um, and as an historian, I always laugh and say it's hard to be upbeat if you're an historian. Most historians are on borderline alcoholics, right? Because you read human history, and human history is written in blood. And it, I always say the stories of history never change, just the names. The same stuff. And I said Salazar, Tojo, Stalin, Mussolini. We had a lot of mini Hitlers. And we do it. Look around the world. Look in the Philippines. Look in Poland. Look in Hungary. Look in Saudi Arabia. Look in Russia. My gosh. There's a lot of these mini autocratic fascists in power, and their public loves them. Um, so yeah, we've got to always find our voice and uh, begin to change this tide. Um, so, sir, um, yes. Okay, one point, can I connect the Great Depression and the rise of Hitler? Absolutely, positively. Uh, that and World War I. At the end of World War I, Germany was punished. Now, they were the belligerent, so maybe they should have been punished. I've written that we should punish them, but we punish them too much. 
uh, deindustrialization, demilitarization, war reparations. Germany was on its knees, and then World War, I mean, and then the Great Depression hits, and it created a victim mentality, and it allowed this failed artist, failed lying corporal to come up and say, blame them, they're at fault. And uh, that was a, res the German people were receptive to that message because of the Great Depression and World War I. There's no question. Um, we oftentimes see during times of economic downturn, right, uh, an us versus them mentality comes out. When we're worried about our jobs, we're worried about our economic viability and livelihood. Yeah, you had a second point? Well, so that violence and fighting, you know, humanity, we're a violent species. Read your history. Uh, there's no culture, no, and I'll end with this. There's no culture because th over that, that's calling my name over there. I told Andy not to, not to hit it, to save me some, right? So um, here's what I'll, uh, in a serious note, um, um, our history is one of violence. It truly is. There's not a culture, not a country, and not a time in history that hasn't done the absolute worst toward one another. The United States. I mean, I'm from Florida where they're trying to remove this from the textbooks, but we committed genocide against the Miccosukee. We tried to. We had three wars against the Seminoles. Uh, then whomever we caught, we sent them out to Oklahoma, and most of them died on the 1830 Indian Removal Act, a.k.a. the Trail of Tears. And that was Andrew Jackson, and he's on the 20. The hell's he on the 24? Um, he was a, a lying, narcissistic rapist and murderer and bigot. Andrew Jackson was a monstrous human being, absolutely horrendous human being, and he's on the 20. Um, so um, there's not been a culture or a country, so, and we need to look in the mirror, too, in the United States. I love my country, but if you love it, you want to make it better, right? And uh, we're still at the tinge of racism. And if you travel, you realize how profound it is in this country, even more so than elsewhere. It's, it's, it's shocking. Uh, we're still homophobic. And by God, are we anti-Semitic. Um, I think, and I, I'll wager, I'm not sure, but at least I find it's with me and my friends and maybe you, that we're in a bubble because of who we surround ourselves with. And sometimes I'll go give a speech and fill in the blank. And I'll come back and go, oh my goodness, wow. I can't believe I got out of there alive, right? I'll get out of here alive tonight with a bunch of cookies. But, um, <laughs> but travel and talk to people. Um, and I always do the, you know, I, I guess maybe I'm, I'm not impolite, I'm very civil, but I like to speak truth to power and the things people say, right? It's extraordinary. Um, so, uh, and, and you've all heard it. Everybody's heard it. Uh, I'll, I'll leave you with one example. My first teaching job out of my PhD was in Alabama. And I left and went to Yale. It was the world's greatest upgrade. Um, but when I was in Alabama, I remember sitting around going, I can't believe I spent all those years in grad school and I'm so in debt and this is what I'm doing. I was like, I'm seriously gonna quit academia and be an artist and live in the Amalfi Coast. I was like, I was like contemplating everything. Um, and uh, I had to teach our philosophy and theory class. Um, so I did fascism, liberalism, communism. I did all the isms, anarchism, right? And I went through it. And when I was teaching it, and I got to uh, fascism, and I was talking about the Holocaust, I had several students, this is the early 90s, say that the Holocaust was fake. It never happened. In a state university in Alabama. And so I asked them how they knew. And they just said, oh, we know. This is pre-internet. And I even had a student, I remember his name was Chad, and his friend's name was Rock. Um, and um, they started yelling that they've never met a Jew, but they can tell a Jew. I'm like, how did you know you never met one? Oh, because you could. I'm like, what, horns? The smell of sulfur? You know, a tail? I'm like, what, are you, what, are you, what are you talking about? But this was in a state university in the early 90s. And I had a full class rebellion against my teaching when I was talking about, about this topic. Uh, so then I said, well, since we're in, let's go in with both feet. So next week, we're going to do feminism. Uh, and I, I, there was a meltdown. 
Um, but yet no one was mad about what the Nazis did. They were mad that I was talking about what happened to Jews and I was talking about women empowerment. This is 1992 at a state university in Alabama. Um, and that stayed with me. And after I, when I went to Yale and then I went to Hawaii, I went to London, I went to Stanford, I went all over the place. Um, and I always volunteered wherever I went to teach our class on the Holocaust, to teach our class on women's history, to teach our class on civil rights history. I'm a non-religious, heterosexual white guy. But I thought that would allow me to bring something unique into the class. And this, of course, the first day, students are like, why are you teaching this? And I'd say, well, let's talk about that. Because I'm an ally, right? Not a bystander. Let's talk about that. Um, so, my, and I got a thousand other stories like that, as to all of you do. Again, Rabbi, thank you. Andy, thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Please uh, enjoy our desserts, and thank you so much again for uh, joining us this evening. I hope you found it uh, quite informational. Thank you.